Good morning, church. Ah, so good to see all of you. It's spring break for many people, and so thank you for being here with us today. I'm looking forward to Easter. But before that, I just wanted to uh, give a warning that I am a huge like Marvel fan, huge Marvel fan, and that has nothing to do with Easter except for that I love superhero stories, and I love to see uh, comeback stories, and I love to see what God could do in that kind of story. And so that's really what Easter is all about, right? Speaking of superheroes, when you were a kid, which was your favorite superhero, right? When you were sitting around talking and your friends were like, hey, if you could be one superhero, who would you be? And here's the thing, you can't be Spider or Superman, he's cheating. So anyway, all right, who would you be? Tell the person next to you, who are you gonna be? I'm trying, I'm trying. Some of you, I had this conversation with some people today, they're like, I don't know, I don't care about any of that stuff. And to you, I'm so sorry, <laughs> you are not welcome at our church anymore. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding. So of course, when I was a kid, Every boy, at least in my generation, would have said Spider-Man. And mostly because we didn't know very many others. And Spider-Man was a lot like us. He was just a regular human being. He wasn't born with any special abilities. He got bit by a spider. I don't know if you heard about that tragic, tragic story, I think it's South America, of some boys trying to get bit by like a black widow to get where they wanted to get to like Spider-Man. It did not go well, as you can imagine. And uh, so don't try this at home, kids. It's not a promotional. But Spider-Man was such a big deal that when we started to come out with the newer Spider-Man movies, I got really excited. They were kind of bringing it all together. And so I started, my boys were finally old enough just a couple years ago, and we binge watched all of them and then went and saw the re most recent last one at the movie theater together. It was super, super cool. It was like two weeks of just awesomeness. And every time the movie's over, my boys were just like celebrating and fighting and tackling and imagine shooting, you know, spider webs at each other in the whole nine yards. It was great. But there's something you realize when you binge watch them. There is a quote that happens in like the first movie from like forever ago, like 15 years ago, it was like forever ago nowadays, and then it continues all the way through. Do you remember this? Anybody else speak up about this? So here's the first one. This came from Uncle Ben to Peter Parker, who was Tobey Maguire at the time of Spider-Man 2002, right? So I guess we're at like 22 years. And the quote was this, with great power comes great responsibility. You remember that? All right, so then, like, they didn't do much with that because you had those three movies. And then we move into the next set of movies, The Amazing Spider-Man, and we get kind of another version of the same thing, except for this time it's Uncle Ben, Martin Sheen, to uh, Andrew Garfield, who is now playing Spider-Man. He says, he believed that if you could do things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. That's what's at stake here, not choice, responsibility which is an extremely wordy version of with great power comes great responsibility. It's like, wow, you sure took the long way around to get there, right? Over the river and through the woods. Hey, responsibility, we finally made it in. They were trying so hard not to say it. But it didn't necessarily get a lot better than that, right? Because then we get the Tom Holland coming along and he says, woo, Tom Holland. When you could do the things I can, but you don't, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. And now Peter is saying this to Tony Stark. It's like, man, we're just gonna keep trying to never say that same quote again, right? Then we finally get to the last one. They threw in the towel, they're like, let's just give all the fanboys service, and they finally say it. So Aunt May, as I think it's as she's dying, I think it's a moment, but she says, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. Do you remember this? Does anybody else pay attention to these things? You will see it if you binge watch it now. You're welcome. Start this today. By next Sunday, you're going to get it. You're like, what does this have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with the fact that they ripped off the entire quote in the first place. The entire quote actually came from the original Spider-Man hero, Jesus, who, no, <laughs> little bit of a stretch. Okay. Well, Jesus said it this way, Luke chapter 12, verse 48. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. That's way better than anything Spider-Man came up with, except for I'm using this as a funny way to introduce some of the hardest things that Jesus says in the entire Bible. It's like, if I can get you laughing now, it'll make you feel better when you're crying later. All right? So... This is a really important concept, though, because everything else I say is built on that one verse. With much power comes much responsibility. That's essentially what Jesus is getting to. So now, I got you hanging on. What is exactly Jesus says? Jesus will not look like the Jesus you've been told he looks like today. 
He will not look like a Mamby Pamby. He will not look like a just grace always. Years ago, I was on Facebook and I was communicating with one of my former students from Colorado and uh, he always had these alternate views of Jesus. And I would say, I, he's, he posted something on what I shared. I literally shared a Bible passage. He told me the problem with the church in America today is the way that I abuse God's word to blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, wait a minute. All I did was quote a passage from Jesus. And he said, that the problem is your interpretation of Jesus. And then I went and grabbed this passage today and said, well, what do you do with this? And he said, I'm done talking to you. So <laughs> Jesus does not look like we always want him to look. Jesus does not say what we always want him to say. But if he is God, he has the right to do that. And the question for us is not, does Jesus say hard things? The question for us ought to be, what do we do with the hard things that Jesus told us? So what I did this week in, in prep for this message is I did a deep dive on what Jesus says. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start to pull out little nuggets all along the way until we get to the really hard thing. And it's, I hope it's all gonna make more sense when we get there, all right? Let's just go ahead and jump in. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus says, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Now, in Jesus' day, first century Palestine, uh, it was natural for uh, uh, the Romans to have slaves, Many Jewish people also had slaves, but slavery looked different, and it didn't exactly look like American slavery either. In fact, there was something even called a bond slave or a bond servant. And a bond slave or a bond servant was, uh, was, was a person who they had a debt to pay and they paid off the debt. And sometimes if they had a really good master, those same people would come back and work and just dedicate their lives. In fact, in the Old Testament, we're told that if a person wanted to do that, they could actually kind of go to the courts and actually get it official. And they were now not just a slave because they had to be, but they were choosing to be. And I think this is what Jesus is trying to get to in all of this. And what would happen in that day is it was their job to basically work for the master and do whatever needed to be done around the place. Now, that being said, imagine you ever see like the, the full length togas you notice in any kind of Jesus y film you see from the first century or ancient Rome. That's kind of what they would have. And so when Jesus said, I want you to be dressed and ready for service, the phrase be dressed and ready literally, and the King James Version nails this, is gird up your loins. If you don't get anything else out of today, you ought to just get this little phrase because it's fun, if nothing else. But that launched me onto a Google search. What does it mean to gird the loins? Don't worry, it's totally appropriate, as weird as it might sound to you. So because everybody's wearing this full-length sheet, you gotta imagine it's like putting on a potato sack in a lot of ways, right? So you're wearing this full-length sheet. Now I watched some videos and I watched some, or I, watched, I read some articles and I thought this little clip here did as good a job as any is describing what girding your loins looked like. So girding your loins, you may not be able to see all this, but first you would gather together all the material up like this, then you'd kind of put it into two piles, push it back through your legs, wrap it around, and then there were three or four different ways, or two different ways to actually finally do this, but you would tie some sort of knot. Sometimes there was a belt, you'd tie it to the belt or wrap it around the belt, whatever it is. The whole point is you had to pick all this stuff up because you're gonna be working and working hard and working immediately, and you need to be ready. It's gotta be out of the way. So this is like the least manly thing in our day that you can think of, right? But this is what it means to gird your loins. And really what it means is be dressed and ready. That's why the NIV puts it like that. Because the whole idea, if you're a servant and your master needs something immediately and you're not ready to go, you might trip, you might fall, you might get dirty, you might mess something up. And so, because you can't risk all of that, especially if the master's got a big deal going on and it's your job to make them look good, then you've got to be ready for, for service. And so Jesus says, I want you to be dressed and ready. And then he says, it will be good. And the thing for good here, this is the same word as blessed. I don't want to camp too long on this, but a fascinating little thing, the, the Bible Project guys, if you go to YouTube or just go to uh, Google and search Bible Project, they're doing a series right now on the Sermon on the Mount, and they're covering blessed, blessed are they. And the word here, makarios, it literally means something like happy. It's this idea of abundance, blessed. It will be good, blessed for those servants, doulas, I'll get to that in a second, 
whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself, literally the phrase there is, he will gird his loins to serve. That's a different word. And that's critical to understanding everything happening here. He will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. Okay, so let's unpack some of this because I think it's going to help us out a little bit. So the way that these wedding parties would often work is there were things that were happening outside the home. And so when the, the master or the groom is coming back and he's ready for something, he's telling the servants, the doulasses, I want you to be standing and ready and watching it and waiting. So when I come to the door, you're ready to go. There's no, hang on, I'll be there in a minute. I got to gird my loins. I got to get everything prepped. He's ready or she's ready to go. It's about responsiveness, preparedness, and readiness. Now, the key to understanding what's happening here is to understand some of the different words and what they mean. And then to understand the impact of what Jesus is saying to us. So the word here for bond servant or slave, it's doulas. It literally refers to a believer who willingly lives under Christ's authority as his devoted follower. That's the way the New Testament is using it. It's got its own meaning and culture. But it refers to that person who, again, we got one of two options. We don't know exactly which one Jesus had in his mind because he didn't say, I mean this one. But it means either that person who is under a debt, which fits the analogy. What we're going to celebrate next week is this week we celebrate Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay our debt. And so therefore, I owe him everything. And I will spend my life owing him everything. It'll never be paid because he paid it all. That's one way to look at it. Or because the debt has been paid and I am now freed, I am choosing to be under your authority. I like both. I think both works really well. The second one's probably a little bit more appropriate for the Christian because he has paid it all. The debt has been paid. So therefore, I'm going to give him my life and service. That's the word that Jesus uses when he says, be dressed and ready, slave. Be dressed and ready, servant. And here the problem in America is we find that offensive because of the evil of American slavery. And American slavery was evil. But Jesus is saying, I have paid your debt. Give me what is mine, which is you. Now, you got to put this in the context of everything else Jesus says. But my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me, you who are weary. I am gentle and humble in heart. All these things that Jesus says, he's not a cruel master. He's not a, har he's not a mean master. He's not a harsh master. But he is still a master. And if we do not understand that, then the next thing makes no sense. Because then what Jesus says is, and if you do this, if you gird your loins, if you stay dressed and ready, if you serve me when I show up, what will happen when I show up then? I'll return the favor. And I will serve you. And the word that he uses for serve is not the same. He doesn't use doulas. He uses diakonos. And you may go, I don't care. You should. Diakonos is literally the word that we use in the New Testament for the word deacon or minister or servant. It's an important word because it refers to a servant, but literally it means to raise up dust by moving in a hurry to care for the needs of others. Nobody got excited about that. Notice this. Jesus doesn't use the word doulos to refer to himself. Jesus will never be your bond slave or your bond servant but Jesus will serve you. My last pastor used to call this the law of the bigger yes. The law of the bigger yes. And what that means is I'm gonna say yes to what matters for eternity by sacrificing something else important today. I think a visual could help us here. So if you imagine with me for a minute, Now, this line, anybody remember math? This line represents eternity. Now, in a true line, it's going to go like this, right? It's never going to stop. It's just going to keep going in either direction. That's time from God's vantage point. God is the only eternal being. 
He is outside of time. He has no beginning and he has no end. That's eternity. Somewhere in God's eternity, and I know this is big, probably too big for our brains to wrap around, but somewhere in God's eternity, he decided to create. And when he created, he began a journey of love for us. And somewhere along the way, we sinned, we fell, we rebelled against God. But God decided not to leave us there, so he sent his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not die and be separated from him forever, but instead would have everlasting life. John chapter three, verse 16. Now that's important because Jesus is building on this idea and he says, if you come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and you receive my love and my life inside you, receive the debt that I paid to pay your debt, then what you will get, instead of eternal separation and death from me, you will get eternal life. Now, the trade that Jesus is making to us is he's basically saying, if you will give me these 80 years of your life right here, I will give you eternity. Anybody want to make a trade? And if you serve me here, I will serve you there. Now, don't misunderstand, right? He's the master, you're the slave. But this master, he, when you show up, he's gonna gird his loins, he's gonna get himself dressed and ready, and he's going to serve you. He's gonna meet your needs. He's going to care for you, which is what he's been doing every day of your life. But he's going to do it for eternity. So instead of being eternally separated from him, you're gonna be eternally blessed by him. And we wonder if it's worth it. But I really want to do this, but I really want to enjoy that, but I really want to have this, but I really want to experience that. And God, you're holding out on me. And he's like, no, no, I'm offering you the deal of a lifetime. But I also know how hard this is. Like me personally, I get how hard this is. But I also see it, right? I mean, so many of us today, we make more money than we've ever made or thought we could ever make. And we spend it all so quickly and so easily, don't we? And people tell us, if you just save up, someday you're gonna retire and you're gonna want some of that money. You think, someday I should get around to doing that. And it's really hard to put off today because I'm thinking about tomorrow. But this is exactly what Jesus is asking us to do. He's saying, I want you to give up something good today, something you wanna say yes to today for something that's even better for tomorrow. And if you do that, trust me, it'll all be worth it in the end. He goes on, Luke chapter 12. 38, it will be good, blessed, for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. What does he mean when he says ready? Well, this is a complex analogy Jesus is using, and he uses it a lot. We're gonna see it again throughout the book of Luke. We see it throughout the New Testament. We see it in the book of Matthew and Mark. <clears throat> the reason is Jesus talked about it so often, he found this analogy very, very, very fitting for what's happening. Here's what he means. There are two uh, appearances of Jesus. The first appearance, we call this the first coming. He came, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead. Then he went back up into heaven and there will one day be a second appearance. Jesus will return and take all of those who love him to spend eternity with him. But the problem is nobody knows when that's gonna happen. We don't know the exact day or the exact hour. I think it's gonna be tomorrow at two, but because I'm not sure, I have to be ready, my loins girded, literally at every single moment. If I could tell you right now, guys, I had a dream last night, and I know this dream was from Jesus. Jesus appeared to me and told me, next week, Monday at 3.30, he will return. 
Do you think you would spend the last week before Jesus came back doing everything you could imagine doing that was good to do? Now, if Jesus did come back in a week, great. But if Jesus didn't come back in a week, but you died in a car accident or a heart attack before that week got here, would it change anything? See, the problem in America is we always think we have more time. We always think we can put off for another day what God has asked us to do right now, right now. That's why Jesus goes on and he says in verse 39, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, gird your loins, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus is not saying he's a thief. He's just using a great analogy. The analogy is simply this. Uh, the other night, <clears throat> I went to bed. We just had to get a new car. Our other car died. I think I said that last week. And uh, I heard a noise. Our car was in the driveway. And I heard a noise. And it was like 3 in the morning or something like that. And so I got out of bed and I quickly looked because I thought, oh, man, what if somebody's breaking into my car? Like, it's funny how we become attached to things, right? It's like Jesus knew what he was talking about. When he said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be. I was anxious. Somebody was breaking. I got nothing in the car that's worth anything. I don't buy fancy cars. I mean, it was like, it was nice for me. I really love this new car. I really like it. But it's just a car. At the end of the day, who cares? But that's the point. If I had known somebody was coming to get into my car or steal my car or break into my car, I would be standing out there ready to jump, surprise them in the back seat, like, ha ha, right? And like, let's have this standoff, right? Here we go. That's what Jesus is saying. If the thief tells you he's coming at three in the morning, are you just gonna sleep through the night? Of course not. You're gonna be dressed and ready to take on the thief. Jesus says, how about me? Since you don't know the day or the hour that I'm coming, since I'm not going to tell you it's next week at two, it might be before Matt finishes the sentence. <laughs> Pass that one. Because you don't know, be ready always. Be ready always. Now, Peter looks at him because remember, Jesus just talked to the whole crowd and Peter goes, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? If you go back and read Luke 12, there's moments he's talking to everybody. There's moments he's talking to the disciples. And Peter's picking up on that like, I'm confused, Jesus. It's not clear what you're saying. And here, I love Jesus' answer because he never answers. Jesus says, the Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants and give them their food allowance at the proper time? And Peter's like, uh-huh. Yeah, good question. Who is it? What does that have to do with what I asked you? Now, it's important to understand what Jesus is saying. Peter wants to know, are you talking only to the disciples? And Jesus says, look at the wise manager. Whoever the wise manager is, that's who I'm talking to. The word wise manager here literally is a person who often functioned as what's called the steward of a household. They were generally a freedman, that is a slave that was released from forced legal servitude. So put all the pieces together. So what would happen is you would have a family and they would have a servant or slave. And in the Roman culture, the more servants or slaves you had, the more, the more prominent and important and wealthy that you were. So Jesus is picturing himself here in this analogy he's been telling. He's the master, and he's got many servants or slaves. And the steward, the wise manager, is the person who oversees the other people. It's their job to be an overseer. They are a steward, a household manager of resources, of people, of responsibility. So when Peter asks, are you talking to us or are you talking to everybody? And Jesus' answer is, I'm talking to every steward out there. So quick question, has God entrusted people and resources to you? Anybody out here lead a team? Anybody run a business? Anybody own a business? Any parents in the room? Any grandparents? Jesus is clearly identifying people who have been entrusted with responsibility in his world. Now, I'm going to put the pieces together in just a minute. We're trying to like lay them out on the table like a big puzzle or a mosaic. And like, what do we do with all these? 
Let's just keep laying out some pieces because what Jesus says next is one of the hardest things that Jesus ever says. Verse 43. It will be good for that servant who the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. If you are faithful with whatever God has entrusted to you here, he's going to give you responsibility over everything there. Holy cannoli as massive. It's a massive opportunity he is offering us. Then he goes on, he says, but suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. I mean, it's been 2,000 years. And he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and to drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Okay, so not the nice Jesus you read about on TikTok, right? Not the grace-only Jesus that you've often heard about in modern American culture who sounds really nice. My wife's favorite quote uh, she's been using with me since we got married, she uses it with my kids all the time, is, uh, he ain't playing. <laughs> and I think I like to say that right now because it makes me feel better about what Jesus really did say. Let's put these pieces together. The word here for cut them to pieces is best translated. I got this from Thayer's Greek lexicon. Here the word is more fitly translated cut up by scourging or scourge severely. A scourging is what they did to Jesus before he was crucified. If you ever saw the Passion of the Christ, typically it was done with something called the cat of nine tails. That was the particular whip they used that just shredded flesh from Jesus. There were also other forms of scourging, which Mel Gibson's movie showed well. If you've seen it, if you haven't, you'd have to watch it, but it's not for the faint of heart. The idea of cutting to pieces is that I will punish them. But the worst part is not the punishment. The worst part is, he says, and then assign them a place with the unbelievers. Do not misunderstand this. I don't have enough time to go further than this statement. Jesus is not saying you will be saved by what you do. It's not what he's saying. But he's saying, if I have paid your debt and I have freed you, and you've accepted my payment, and you choose to live for me in this tiny little thing going on here, if you choose to live for me, I'm gonna honor you and bless you. But if you say you've accepted it and you will not choose to live for me, then I will consider you as somebody who never accepted me. I work for Jesus because I'm saved by Jesus. He paid the debt. But this is James's point when James says, you say you have faith, great. I will show you my faith by my works. The two are so interconnected that James just blends up. Yes, of course I'm saved, not by what I do, but because he saved me, he paid it all. Therefore, all to him I owe. Jesus goes on in verse 47, he says, the servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment, he'll be beaten with few blows. Oh, that sounds encouraging, good. The bad news for you is I'm gonna tell you all the time what Jesus wants, so you probably should find another church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, trying to make a light. All right, moving on. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now, let me try to bring this home. For those of you who haven't been here, and Jesus sounds really scary and terrifying, this is why you hate church, I want you to get the pieces because this is exactly what you want Jesus to be, and here's why. Earlier in chapter 12, Jesus looked at the poor and the needy 
And he said, I got your back. Do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. God clothes the flowers of the field. He takes care of the birds, the ravens, and the sparrows. How much more so will he take care of you, little flock whom he loves? Now, if Jesus says that to those who are poor and needy, how does he intend to take care of the poor and the needy? And the answer is through those who are rich and powerful. How can he say to the poor and needy, I'll take care of you, if he never looks at the rich and the powerful and says, and you better take full responsibility with the resources I've given you to take care of those in need? What kind of faithful, loving, just God would he be if he didn't call out the rich and the powerful? And before you think he means somebody else, just sit with it like Peter for a minute and say, who do you mean, Lord? And then have him give a very nonspecific answer so that you will have to stand before him and say, do you mean me? God, am I dressed and ready? Am I morally prepared for that day? Have I done my business with you? Have I gotten my affairs in order? Have I gotten my life together? Am I prepared for the day? Because I don't want you to look at me and say, receive your punishment and be away from me. I want you to say, thank you. Thank you for doing what I asked. I'm gonna serve you now. You get to be in charge of everything. That's what I want. So the tension of this text is that Jesus is inviting us in to see his view of the world. Yes, he has given some five talents and some one talent, but he's asked all of them to be responsible with what he's given them. Take care of those. The poor will always be with you. You are never gonna stop that this side of heaven, but you can leverage whatever time and talent and treasure that God has given you for the good of the earth. And what I really want you to see is this. While Jesus demands obedience, he also gives us grace when we fail. It means he doesn't expect perfection, but he's gonna keep calling you back to him. And maybe this for you is a calling back moment. Real quick, I wanna read. Paul picks up on all of this teaching of Jesus and in the book, 1 Thessalonians, he spits it all back out. And I want you to hear the way what Paul says connects with everything else. Just listen, ready? He says this. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Sound familiar? While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You were all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us. Whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. I've been praying all morning and all week for you. I've been living with this text for a couple of weeks. It's been wrecking me as I analyze my own life and go, God, am I living up to the calling that you've placed upon me? Am I taking serious everything you've required and asked of me? Because God, you have given me much. I wanna stand before you and have you say, well done. Not away from me, I never knew you. So I don't know where this lands exactly for you, but I want you to see Jesus as a master who longs to use you in this world to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And instead of running away from him, to step into it and say, here I am. Take my life, take my heart, take my resources, take my time, take me, God, and let it be. Do whatever you want with me. In fact, we're gonna sing that right now. And if you don't know the song, that's okay. You'll figure it out. But jump in when you're ready. Would you just stand with me? And I'm gonna pray. And then we're going to sing.
my Lord and my God. Thank you for letting us know the seriousness of Jesus' challenge to us. And Lord, let it sit heavy with us so that we can come to Jesus and say, what do you want from me? You can have it all. You've paid it all. So Lord, in anything that we're withholding from you, anything that we're keeping back from you, anything that we feel like belongs to us, but it really is yours, God, take it now. Take it and let it be consecrated or set apart for you. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.